Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending this session where we are going to talk about two very exciting topics together. Uh, and uh, I, if some of you attended the previous two sessions in the same room, they also talked about it from a very technical perspective. Uh, I got a great group of panelists here to talk about it more on what we can do now and in the future. So my name is Larry Curvalo. I'm the moderator for this session. I'll just go over the agenda before I let the panelists uh, introduce themselves. So uh, first thing, we are going to, after the introductions, talk about the overview of generative AI. I'm assuming everybody in this room knows Wasm, but let's have Aparna talk about um, you know, Gen AI and our other two CTOs will talk about how Wasm fits into Gen AI. We'll talk about some use cases, real use cases, and then I would really want the audience to put your thinking caps and say what are the other use cases you would like to see and, and you know, think about for where you can start doing some radical you know, innovation with these two technologies. And that's that part of the audience use case discussion leave some time for Q&A. And with, uh, with that, just briefly, I am an independent analyst, and my success story is to bring these kinds of panelists and just watch them do the magic. So start with Tyler, a quick introduction. Hi, I'm Tyler McMullen. I'm the CTO and co-founder of Fastly. Uh, and um, I guess like my, my quote unquote bona fides regarding AI are that I, I worked on a lot of recommendation systems and vector systems and dimensionality reduction problems and all sorts of <laughs> things like that. But that was all uh, at least 12 years ago. So I'm like 12 years out of date and trying to get updated on AI now. Uh, but it is starting to come together and I got some opinions. Great. Uh, next, Radu. Hey, I'm, the, uh, I'm Radu. I'm the CTO and co-founder of Fermion. Uh, I've been, uh, before we started Fermion, I worked at Microsoft on a few projects that were the intersection of distributed systems and inferencing on the edge and, and building this, this on, on this thing called WASINN and uh, recently working on AI as well at, at Fermion and building a, uh, an AI inferencing service as well. And Aparna? Hi, I'm Aparna Sinha. I'm currently a partner at PearVC, which is a small seed stage VC firm, one of the top in the country with $432 million to invest. Um, I'm leading the AI and enterprise investments. Previously, I was at Google for the last 10 years, most recently in Google Cloud, running the developer group, and before that, an early person on the Kubernetes project. Um, and my background is in electrical engineering. I did my undergrad, master's, PhD at Stanford in EE, and I've also worked in consulting at McKinsey, so really very much into the enterprise use cases of AI here. And what I learned from Aparna, you got about 10, 12 startups that you are Coaching. That's right. Yeah, it's I'll a, talk about that later. But yeah, 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 we've got. I've started a program for generative AI startups as a like a YC um, kind of program at Pair VC, much smaller than YC, focused on Gen AI. We've got eight startups in incubation since July, uh, doing everything from synthetic data generation to healthcare AI to um, uh, yeah, uh, tooling yep. for LLM evaluation, etc. So it's a very exciting time. So what we're going to do for the next few minutes is talk about Gen AI and, and really bring it together in, in, in the same few next slides, which Aparna is going to lead. And um, you know, Radu and uh, Tyler are going to contribute to how WASM fits into that, OK? So with that, Aparna, just let me know when you want the slides yeah, to be moved uh, forward. I'll Thank you. So I'm kind of um, an accidental venture capitalist. As I mentioned, I was an operator at, at Google. When I started at Pear, which was by accident as an entrepreneur in residence, AI was generative AI was just starting to take off. One of the things I'd been working on at Google was using um, AI models inside Google and using them to generate code uh, to make developers more productive in Google Cloud. This is something uh, GCP just debuted in, in the form of uh, one part of the duet offering from Google Cloud last week. Um, and so at Pair, they asked me to put together our thesis on generative AI. We were starting to see upwards of 10 startups a week that were all focused on generative AI, and we needed to figure out what to invest in and what not to invest in. So I'm going to present some of that thesis. Uh, Pair, as I mentioned, is very early stage. So the startups we see are going from idea to product market fit, zero to one. 
Um, yeah, we can click into this slide because yep. yeah, there's a build, right? So we believe that what we're seeing is a shift just like what we saw with web technologies in the 1999-2000 era and then later with mobile. That's what, what we're seeing with generative AI today. Um, and that means also that it's very early days. Many things still need to happen, just like with web and mobile, you know, a new interface needed to be developed. One of the questions we are evaluating is what will be the new interface? You know, chatbots are kind of like very 2020. And now here we are in late 2023, um, you know, are there going to be other types of interfaces that are more interactive, lower latency, you know, richer, browser-based, and I think there's an opportunity for WASM there. Secondly, the application architecture that incorporates generative AI, that has been evolving just in the last uh, 12 months even, uh, where there's a lot more use of retrieval augmentation because obviously generative AI models hallucinate. So how do you make it usable, say, in a hospital context or a legal context or an enterprise context? Uh, so retrieval augmentation is something that is emerging. It's certainly not a solved problem. Um, and also the use of plugins. Again, that might be an area where Wasm has a role to play. And then lastly, hardware evolution. We're starting to see models that can run on multiple different kinds of hardware. That's always been the case, but now the models are much more capable and much more easily accessible. And then the hardware itself is evolving to become more efficient for these models. So these are some of the things that are yet to happen in AI, and 2022 was just the beginning. We've got a road ahead, I think, for the next four or five years as this evolves. And I'd like to invite my uh, fellow panelists to comment on some of this, if you'd like. Oh, I'll, I'll say things as soon as I disagree with something you say, but you're just dead on. What is there to add? Well, anything, any, we, we have more, more areas as well as we go on for, for you to disagree with me. So let's go to the next slide. Yeah, I, I do think the hardware evolution is where you're going to see some uh, role played because what Wasm brings to the table is run anywhere, run efficiently. And I, but my view of this is as hardware evolves to be, you know, better, obviously, latency and efficiencies, especially energy efficiencies, you're going to be able to see some things run on the edge, even in a disconnected way, you know, much better and faster. Yeah, I'll say a couple more things here. So, like, I think if you look at, like, the, the timeline there, you can see, like, the web in 1999 was a lot of, again, as it mentions there, static websites. And, like, the upside of that was that static websites, uh, you know, were fast. Right, like your internet connection might not have been fast, but the websites themselves were pretty fast, right? And as we started to like evolve those sites and evolve those interfaces, they started to get slow. And then a lot of applications, a lot of companies out there realized, oh, wow, there's a really strong direct connection between the latency that end users experience and the amount that they use our product, right? And so like as we moved into like the mobile phase there, <clears throat> that was even more important, right? Because mobile devices were less powerful, because like mobile connections were less like consistent. And so there was a lot of emphasis on like the user latency. And so I think one of, you know, maybe this is just from the Fastly perspective, but I think it's also from like the generally WebAssembly perspective, because I think we have a lot of focus on latency and speed inside of WebAssembly. Um, making sure that like we find ourselves in a place where we don't lose all the effort that we have put into reducing latency for users uh, as we move to this like new AI generation, you know. Yeah, there's a lot of opportunity here. I've started to see startups that are running the application entirely in the browser and then making calls to an LLM. You're starting to see applications even on the phone that are chatbots that are speaking to you, and there is a latency associated with the speech and with the recognition. There's a lot of opportunity to kind of make that experience better. Yeah, and, and from from my perspective, I think the, the most exciting intersection between AI workloads and WebAssembly is through that portability, right? Being able to build an application and not know ahead of time where you are going to execute that application, whether it's going to be on device or whether it's going to be on an edge or somewhere in the cloud and being able to dynamically move that. WebAssembly is a technology that can fundamentally make that possible. And that's one of the most exciting use cases that I'm, that I'm seeing for that. Okay. You stole my point, that's such a good one. So um, I always like to show a little bit of the history of where this technology came uh, from. It's been many decades of work that have led to the breakthroughs that have led to generative AI becoming something that is consumer grade and is useful for you and I, as well as useful in the enterprise. But the most recent three breakthroughs that I think are notable, uh, number one is the invention of the transformer and this, um, you know, attention is all you need paper that came around 2017 from 
Google. And this uh, transformer model is something that has been used extensively across many different types of uh, you know, generative AI capabilities, whether it's LLMs or it's diffusion models or other kinds of models. And specifically, I think the discovery that you know, as you make these models larger beyond six billion parameters, there's emergent behavior. That has been somewhat of a surprise and some, a big breakthrough uh, in machine learning, uh, you know, breakthrough that I think people have dreamed about for decades. Um, and combined with that, uh, you know, training these models, these large language models on enormous general purpose data sets, like this is an example of the pile data set, and you can see there's many different types of data here, including code and text and what have you, um, that, um, you know, not labeled data set, really a unsupervised or self-supervised learning over these large data sets have led to models that are very general purpose. So you can ask them any kind of question. Um, and then lastly, the third piece is really refinement of the strategy of transfer learning, taking that large general purpose model and then uh, training uh, through fine tuning a small, a smaller model that's task specific, whether that task is question answering or it's uh, you know, fine tuned on a specific data set, say for a hospital use case, that can be a much smaller model and it can still have very good performance in terms of uh, you know, a a question answering for that domain. It can have very good domain specific performance and yet be a much smaller model, which means it's you know, inference is at lower cost potentially on different types of devices. Uh, and then finally, the alignment techniques like RLHF and RLAIF that are still, uh, you know, in progress. These are, I think, the three breakthroughs that have led to the kind of modern generative AI applications that we're seeing. There's still a lot of evolution happening on the system side into, in, into finding alternative mechanisms for attention, increasing the context length potentially finding alternative mechanisms to the transformer, which is still a very energy hungry architecture on GPUs. And then um, also on the data side, you know, there's entire legal issues about copyright and how to make, um, you know, the data sets, uh, you know, uh, uh, more explainable and, uh, uh, you know, put regulations around them. And then finally, lots of work on RLHF. Um, I think, yes. I'll just say like, I think one of the things I'm most looking, if you can go back one real quick. Okay. Yeah, one of the things I'm most looking forward to with WebAssembly and like the AI space is, you know, over on the left side there, like the explanation of the transformer, like that's just one version of the transformer. It's like the original version of the transformer, right? And all these things, all the all the different versions of the transformer algorithm are, are potentially applicable across many different types of models. And so when we think about like, uh, you know, for those of you who are paying close attention to the component model, you can imagine a world in which we have all of these different versions of the transformer that are actually like made available as a component that you can just take WASINN and plug a new model into. Like being able to like plug and play different things like this, while also being able to like trust the security of the uh, of the system that's running it, like that, that seems like it'll also potentially be a game changer because well, let me tell you, I've been spending a lot of time looking at the security of the various like AI frameworks and it is a nightmare. <laughs> And, and, and uh, on, on the right side, I think the, the potential of being able to take a few hundred megabytes of fine tunings and being able to ship your WebAssembly component with a fine tuned, uh, small fine tuned models to a platform that already has a base model, a foundation model, and being able to run that dynamically and change the, the, the behavior of your, of your model. Uh, I, that's one of the most exciting things that, that I'm uh, thinking about. Yeah, and that is actually precisely our thesis, our investment thesis, um, and we can go to the next slide, in, in Pair VC is uh, the ability to take these uh, larger uh, models, foundation models. This chart is showing, you know, in white, the, the open source foundation models, and you are seeing, um, you know, across the vertical axis that there's many different types of models. Obviously, there's natural language uh, processing models. There's image and video models. Lots of evolution there with segment anything, and uh, stable diffusion's gotten much, much better uh, speech. And then, and then finally, these models are also being applied to protein synthesis. So we see many, many applications of generative AI that are beyond just natural language and we're starting to see this not just available in proprietary form as an API say from OpenAI but also much more capable models available in the open source to you and I and every developer uh, in a variety of different sizes uh, and this is just accelerating you know every time you know you see the mosaic uh, MPT model that's very capable in multiple different sizes and then Llama 2 comes along and then Code Llama most recently in multiple different sizes fine-tuned for different tasks as well and it just opens up a new realm 
um, uh, of, of possibility, especially for startups. So our thesis is uh, on the next page, um, and this is the kind of startups we've invested in, is um, startups that are using open source uh, large language models and fine tuning them. So taking a large model, fine tuning it on proprietary data for let's say a hospital or a law firm or an accounting firm, fine tuning it on that proprietary data and building something that's task specific, potentially multiple models that are chained together to achieve a particular enterprise workflow, augmenting that with uh, sources of truth, databases you know, through retrieval augmentation. I will show you an architecture on the next slide. But that is a architecture that provides you know, not only a cost-effective uh, mechanism to build an application for a startup, but also provides somewhat of a moat because you have uh, that proprietary data. You've got your own models that you're running. So that is um, what we've been funding, um, and we believe that that you know that that's an opportunity for a startup to to, to become a big company. And then, of course, just uh, we also fund uh, you know and are looking for uh, tooling that uh, allows for the development and the CI/CD and testing of such applications, composite applications, and lastly, of course, systems innovations. Yeah, we'll go to the next slide. Uh, so why train your own models? Why, and I don't mean pre-training, why fine tune your own models? It gives you the data mode. It allows for personalization. It has, it provides much more control. You're not dependent on open AI or Anthropic or anyone else whose you know model quality changes over time, and uh, you have many deployment options, which is uh, you know you can deploy on the edge, you can deploy on devices, you can deploy in the customer's cloud, and it's much more cost efficient. So this is, I think, a good slide perhaps to, for the Wasm CTOs to weigh in because I think this this dovetails really nicely with with the with the properties of Wasm as well. Uh, and to, to to that point, I think the uh, being able to run this sort of uh, inferencing and and I, I think taking a step back uh, from from at least our perspective, we see in the world of of AI, we see uh, inferencing as being the operation that most people are interested in in executing, as in training and data processing are uh, beasts of their own. But what we see most often. Uh, users and customers are asking for is, I want to run inf inferencing, I have this model, and uh, I want to run inferencing on it. And being able to do that in a way that's cost effective on one hand and doesn't suffer from minutes long cold starts is something that we've been, uh, an operation that we've been tackling for web services and serverless applications. And it's something that we've been uh, thinking about for the last few months for inferencing as well. And uh, being able to execute inferencing on things like Llama 2 and Code Llama is something that we've just announced on, on Fermion Cloud this week, uh, together with things like uh, generating sentence embeddings and storing them in a vector database and retrieving and augmenting prompts that you then send to the language model. So it's, it's very much in line with what we've been seeing and what we've been uh, building for the last few months. Yeah, if we go to the next slide, um, I'll just introduce this. Um, this is the uh, architecture that we are seeing emerging uh, for applications that are AI based. So there's a whole pre-processing step where you maybe take the data from an enterprise. Typically you have to chunk it into many different files um, and then create embeddings from that data. You have to chunk it because the model has a certain context length. Even the largest context length is like 100,000 uh, 100, tokens. Uh, so uh, most documents, like let's say patient records or legal documents or anything that you might use is longer than that. So you have to chunk it, convert it into embeddings, which is essentially a much more efficient vector space. And then you store that in a database, you create an index that is uh, potentially multiple different types of indexes that are optimized for the type of searches that you might do, whether you're doing a keyword search or you're doing a semantic search, a similarity search, depending on what the query is. Um, and in this process, you may call various plugins because again, LLMs only have a certain uh, timestamp up till which they're trained. You may call a plugin to search the web. You may call a plugin to get more recent information. You may call a plugin for actions. There's many different reasons to call a plugin. So the anatomy of a full application has all of this. It has this, um, you know, retrieval augmentation piece that's dependent on this database and index, and it has this ability to call uh, plugins. 
And then the runtime, uh, you know, this is where really the input or the query from the user comes in. Let's say this is a chatbot, that's where you're talking to the chatbot. Your input gets converted into an embedding as well, and then the retrieval orchestration, you know, matches the query with the retrieved uh, data, and then ranks and curates the output appropriately, combines that with the query and any prompt uh, tuning and prompt instructions, prompt templates that you may have, and then ultimately puts that out to uh, an LLM orchestrator, which will choose uh, and potentially use multiple different LLMs that are, again, fine-tuned for specific tasks um, that, you know, that that query may need to go through. And in between all of this is, of course, you know, logging, validation, rate limiting, all of the things that need to happen, you know, from a policy perspective to make sure that you're not putting in information into the LLM that the enterprise doesn't want, or you're not outputting information from the LLM uh, you know, that's biased or toxic or what have you. So this is kind of the emerging architecture. It has that RAG component, it has the prompt tuning, and then it has like multiple specialized LLMs. And we're seeing this in healthcare, we're seeing this across the board with enterprises. By no means is this the final, there's lots of pain points here, um, but this is emerging as at least a sufficiently good solution that overcomes some of the problems of explainability and hallucination and, and lack of um, consistency in output. Yeah, so I'm sure I'm not the only like you know person in the room who uh, has has had the like WebAssembly bug so far embedded into their head at this point that they look at any basically anything like this and go like I could put WebAssembly there and there and there and there, <laughs> right? So like I think looking at this thing, it's just super clear that like there are opportunities for WebAssembly across this entire application stack, right? Um, and I think especially when you start thinking about distributed WebAssembly, that this gets like particularly interesting, right? Um, if I yeah, I'll give Radu a chance to talk, and then I'll, I'll come back. Uh, yeah, I was just going to pick one one probably under under talked uh, uh, box from that architecture, which is plugins, and and point that out as being really really suitable for for using WebAssembly for that. Which is essentially, I want to run some untrusted plugin that someone built uh, in my architecture, and I want to make sure that it doesn't have access to anything that it shouldn't. And uh, putting WebAssembly as a uh, runtime for things like LangChain actions and, and things like that would be a, a phenomenal fit for, uh, for choosing one box to put WebAssembly in. Uh, just for your information, all these slides have been uploaded to our session. So if you need the slides, I know this is a little busy slide. You can, you can pull it down from there, so you ready? Pull yeah, um, so we wanna talk a little bit about use cases. Um, there are, you know, generative AI is a horizontal technology. We believe it's going to transform many different businesses, um, you know, many different verticals. I've listed some of them here. Legal, FinTech, health, biotech, media, retail, manufacturing, anything that requires document understanding or process automation also. You know, um, generative design, um, uh, drug discovery, robotic simulation. And I listed these because we see a lot of progress, lots of startups every week in these areas using generative AI. We also think there's a lot of potential in infrastructure and tool tooling. I mentioned some of that already earlier. What we're going to focus on in terms of use cases here is the first category, which is, which is assistance. And we are seeing assistance across the board. I think the one that is ripe is, of course, engineering and all engineering processes, data, uh, data analytics, um, but also personal assistance. So let's start with that. Um, you know, we're going to look at this specific use case and how Wasm could help this use case. So imagine that you know you have an assistant for your travel needs or your shopping needs, or maybe, you know, these days you can find AI assistants that help you with your fashion and beauty and, you know, experts on, on any kind of thing that you can imagine. And they're actually getting very good. And the reason they're getting very good is because these are not general purpose, you know, uh, anthropic or AI, open AI type models. These are fine tuned models that are specifically, uh, you know, geared towards gardening or beauty or whatever it is. Like to, it's like a human expert in that field giving you advice. So today it's like a chat bot, you know, like you type something and it types back. Um, but, you know, what if it was also, you know, video? What if um, it was also kind of much more animated? Um, what if it had access to plugins and had access to your on-device data? 
um, you know, so that it could give you much more personalized responses. So in the case of, let's say, a travel assistant, what if it could actually look up your calendar and tell you when you have vacation? It could look up your kid's schedule and say, when, you know, is the family aligned to go somewhere? And then had access to plugins, let's say Expedia or whatever, uh, Travelocity, et cetera, and could do uh, not only the searches for you, but could actually also take actions and reserve and make bookings for you. It doesn't seem that far away from where we are. Um, you can also imagine like it giving you a feel for like what the experience might be like to go to a particular place or to try on particular clothing or you know uh, a specific beauty regimen or let's say you know home improvement. These are all things that are kind of just within grasp, but they're not because they're actually quite expensive and they require low latency. They require privacy and secure access. Um, you know, they require, you know, real efficiency on the, on the machine learning side. And so that's where, you know, I wonder if Wasm could, could help us in some of those. Yeah, I mean, this is the exact kind of case that I was talking about earlier when I was thinking about, like, how uh, we as an industry have fought so hard to get back every, every individual millisecond uh, improving, like, the user experience, right? And so especially when it comes to, like, specialized assistance for travel and shopping and things like that in particular, like, you really don't want to lose the, like, the advantage that you have, like, gained by, like, improving that, like, latency of the user experience. I mean, I think the other thing that comes to mind for me with this is that, like, uh, especially in the Internet as it exists today, which is to say, like, one where there are, like, an increasing number of, like, data sovereignty laws and things like that across the EU. There's also examples of this in Australia, California itself, for instance. Um, and when we think about like how user data is going to be used as part of these and where that user data needs to say live, right? This is the kind of case where I think that WebAssembly becomes very helpful because you may need to run this computation across many different platforms, many different platforms in many different locations around the world. Um, so to me, it's just like the fact that WebAssembly is so natively portable, uh, the fact that it is built to be able to run from tiny devices to massive supercomputers, like it gives it a significant advantage in this case. And, and then to, to add on to that, if we look into this future and we'll see each individual person having 12 assistants on their device at any given point, specialized on uh, different, uh, different use cases and different tasks, you can imagine having to install and having to configure and having to give permissions to each individual assistant. Uh, unrestricted access to your device is really scary. So having the ability to run, for example, plugins or extensibility mechanisms or even the core action of, a, of a, such, an, such an assistant, having the ability to run it inside a secure sandbox that you can control access to and control what data it can access uh, and potentially move that across devices and across edge networks is something that I think will have to be a requirement eventually. And WebAssembly is really well positioned to, to tackle at least some uh, of that aspect. So when I look at this, just from my perception, you will see improved customer experience for the people who are going to be using this. And that's going to be the differentiator in oh, the yeah. future. Is it? Improved customer experience as well as like improved security. To me, right. like that's the improved security and privacy are like the two big things that I'm like, Haha, that is going to be killer. And in, in like a few short months, when one of these like frameworks gets popped across the world, right? So it's going to happen. I'm very confident <laughs> in this. Yeah. Go so to the next use case. Second use case. Yeah, this is a real use case. Again, I mentioned healthcare. You know. Um, this is uh, obviously a regulated industry. Obviously, accuracy is extremely important. Privacy is extremely important. But um, one of the use cases many companies are working on this, including you know OpenAI and, and, and Epic as well, is summarizing patient records. This particular example is for the emergency room. You know, a doctor comes in and there's not a lot of time to understand what it is that the history of the patient is and what's actually salient in that history. Uh, AI can summarize across very large patient records. Again, you know, since the context window is small, this is where you have to do the chunking. But um, you know, these applications have that built in. You chunk the record. You use multiple different models to some, some to analyze the um, X-rays and images, some to analyze the text and other notes. Uh, you create a summary. It's like a co-pilot today because, again, you can't trust these summaries 100%, despite the fact that there's a lot of research that's gone into how to suppress hallucinations, how to avoid hallucinations. And most startups are very, very uh, careful about that. And certainly hospitals are not going to use things that aren't, that aren't uh, accurate. Uh, but right now, it's, it's, it's all the pilots are as a co-pilot where this information is given to the physician and the physician decides whether they're going to use it or not. And then there's a lot 
lot of um, sort of paperwork and filing that happens post that pro post that you know that that uh, patient interaction, such as to file insurance claims. A lot of that is error prone and can be done automatically using generative AI. Um, and you know it, it saves time. It, it it makes it more accurate. You know, attaching the right evidence, etc. So this is a real use case. Real companies working on this. Real hospitals trying this out. And again, I I think there are ways that Wasm could could help here. I mean, the exciting thing to me about this particular one is like uh, as mentioned up there, like the cross-platform developer experience. So like in this particular case, you know, if we're talking about you know, a particular platform that is actually in the hospital, like, right, like it's actually a physical server that, it, you know, it's a crazy idea, but like a physical server that is like placed in a building, right? Um, being able to write code that runs there and also runs, say, on Fastly. And also maybe maybe that server is running Spin. Maybe it's running some version of Fastly. Maybe it's running uh, some, some version of like uh, uh, Microsoft's offerings in this case. Um, being able to take that code uh, and, apply it there and yet apply it across the world as well or apply it to your individual cloud outside of there like and have a relatively consistent developer experience across all those that's that's something we've never been able to have before yeah it's extremely important in the healthcare context because most hospitals uh, will not share patient information may not put it in the cloud the the training and the inference have to happen on the hospital servers um, and in other cases, you know, it's patient data that the patient has access to and may or may not want it leaving their device, et cetera. So, uh, That's a great point. Yeah. So I'll, I'll just tell you, uh, having a daughter in me the medicine, medical industry or as a physician, she says how many doctors take a vacation day only to catch up with writing these reports. So anything that can improve productivity, you know, literally where, where people's vacation days are just going to catch up is huge in value for everybody, the doctors, physicians' life, as well as the productivity for the, you know, for the hospital. So you had a question about this slide or something? I, I, I'll go right into Q&A because you raised your thing. We got opinions on this, but I'm curious. All right, I'll, I'll say my opinions. So, I mean, and I don't think this is a setup. To be clear, Matthew works at Fastly, but we did not talk about this in advance. Um, like, my perspective on this is like, there's a way this should be done, which is that there should be one canonical copy of the information, and then, like, ideally, if we can get the latency low enough, being able to generate these things on the fly would be extremely great. I am curious, like, how it is done at the moment, though. Yeah, at the moment, I mean, for this particular application, which is, you know, live in the emergency room, this is online, meaning it is happening, you know, in, it's not, it's not super low latency, but it's happening, you know, during the patient w visit that the summary is being created. It's not hours before. But in theory, you could, uh, certainly the post-patient summary could be written later. Um, and then, you know, maybe it's all these summaries are batched for the doctor to go back and mark them later. That is uh, traditionally without generative AI, like, you know, when you scribe the patient record and somebody goes through and actually like looks at the summary and approves it, that's traditionally how it's done, like in the past. But with generative AI, there's an opportunity to do it, you know, uh, in the actual meeting. Same thing for legal, but there's no reason why those things couldn't be done offline. It's just that, yeah, the, the startups I'm looking at right now doing it, doing it you know, in the visit. The only problem with doing it ahead of time is if you have billions of entries and you don't know which one you're actually going to need, uh, doing it ahead of time for every single entry stops making sense. So if it's low lat latency enough, doing it just in time might just be the best fit. So I would love for you guys to come up with some use cases, which, which we have, if we have some time for that. And the only thing probably going to hold you back is from that wine there. 
So I think the other thing about summarization, there's also chat summarization. Like if you look at, I think we had a CRM use case, you know, you have a team that's trying to do a sale. Oftentimes you want to summarize the chat or you want to say like, here's what's salient about for this customer. You know, you need to do that in the, in the, in, in reasonable time in the chat, not like hours later. Yeah. My question is, um, have you seen any uh, applications or startups in the tutoring space? Um, for example, I would like to you know, send my daughter to a chatbot for her. Uh... Yeah, there's lots. I mean, ed tech is an area that has um, seen a tremendous uh, upheaval, I would say. Um, you know, uh, there's a whole sort of set of VCs that specialize in ed tech. We don't do as much of that. Um, but there's also been companies that previously were not using generative AI that have lost a ton of value, um, you know, after generative AI has come up because it is so easy to, for example, um, you know, uh, do language training, um, you know, to do translation, um, to create, you know, flashcards, uh, to create adaptive tests with generative AI uh, to have specialized personalized tutors. And in fact, one of the major areas of impact of generative AI is personalized education. I think one of the best examples is Conmigo. Um, if you haven't tried that, this is Khan Academy's tutor. It's called Conmigo. I think it, it, it's a nonprofit, but it's like $20. You have to make a donation in order to use it, but it does all of these things. It comes up with learning paths. Um, you know, it provides specialized tu tutoring in many different subjects. I think the uh, danger here in, is in people assuming that they can just use generative AI to generate the actual content that would get into this, which is really scary and not something that I think people should be comfortable doing, at least not right now. But, but for something like Khan Academy, the academy that has like years and years of data and actual uh, lessons and it's phenomenal use case for them. Yeah, living example of the fine tuning point that uh, Parna was making earlier. Yeah, I mean, the um, general purpose models like GPT-4, which is what Conmigo uses, already has, it's trained on so much data, public data that is, you know, that can be used for, let's say, historical, uh, you know, let's say you want to learn about the history of a particular place, it already can generate content. But the content that I've seen originally, you know, is not necessarily verifiable. And so it is, it is frightening. Um, Khan Academy, of course, is train that on their special purpose corpus, and you can imagine fine tuning and, and, and doing that, I think definitely is necessary. Again, that goes back to our thesis, like, you know, we don't recommend, uh, you know, enterprise applications without, without accuracy. We have run out of time, but if there is any more challenging questions, use cases that you want to throw these three wonderful panelists on the, you know, thing, I'm happy to hand you a mic and ask them. Uh, but otherwise, any closing comments? From, from you guys for this whole thing that we started off and ended uh, up? Yeah, quickly, I think uh, what, we're, what we're starting to see is AI making its way into a requirement for full stack applications and uh, a requirement for developers to start injecting capabilities into their uh, existing applications where the central piece might not be AI, it might be a business application that's been around for years, but suddenly they actually have to start thinking about how do I inject these, these capabilities into my application, and this is basically what we're starting to build with the serverless AI offering that we're working on and would be happy to chat and would love to learn about your use cases. Uh, job by our booth. I'll just uh, quickly add that I think that, uh, I think if I had one point to make, it would be that, well, in addition to that AI is cool, uh, it would be that, like, I think the current and future of inference with AI is going to be heterogeneous. It's going to be heterogeneous across multiple different kinds of hardware. It's going to be across the entire world. And I think that WebAssembly is uh, basically in, is the kind of the only platform that is in the position to be able to handle that kind of requirement. Um, from a new platform. Um, and so I, I also tend to think that Fastly is in a particularly good place to handle that as well. So, yeah. yeah. I would say that generative AI is a game changer. It's an excellent time to start a company, um, you know, because there's uh, going to be, uh, you know, opportunities across the board in any kind of workflow, any kind of industry. Um, what I would look for is access to proprietary data, access to expertise. That's, that's like a differentiator, a moat builder in this area. And I think that uh, with Wasm, 
Uh, you know, I'm quite bullish on, uh, you see the trend of large language models moving from proprietary to open source um, and from large to fine-tuned, small, specialized, able to run on different types of hardware, able to, able to run on different types of form factor. I think that that's a, a real opportunity for innovation and I think WASM is a real opportunity for AI workloads. So I'm, I'm keen on, on the developments uh, in this space and um, you know, I'm bullish about investing in this area and potentially building in this area. Great. With that, thank you for attending this session. And please give a hand to our panelists for a wonderful session. And